and welcome to GameSack. Once again, we're talking about some games that we've always wanted to talk about, but we couldn't really figure out how to get them into certain episodes and stuff like that. Yeah, I love these episodes, and I'm actually going to take this opportunity to talk about games like Bill Wash's College Football and, uh, let's see here, the Rugby 95 and uh, probably a couple tennis games. Nah, I'm just kidding. I'm not going to talk about those. Speaking of bad humor, uh, a lot of you think maybe our humor is a little too dry, a little maybe too forced. I don't know. But we've got a new app that we're going to try out in this episode uh, made by uh, comedian Pat Kilbane. It's called The Humor Coach. I'll uh, launch this now. There it is. Oh, yeah, that guy. I remember him. He was on uh, Mad TV, wasn't he? Yeah. Huh, yeah. sweet. There you go. That's pretty funny. Yeah, and he's going to be helping us out, so hopefully our humor will grow. And anyway, let's just get right on into it. Ah, yes, Demon Souls for the PlayStation 3. That's right, multiple souls for a single demon. I was extremely excited for this one when it came out, and initially it was really hard to get a hold of. It's actually a Western-style RPG made by a Japanese company, and it kicks all sorts of ass, mostly yours. This game is tough and you're gonna die a lot. You'll be amazed at how fast your life bar depletes. And even when you're in a menu, the rest of the world doesn't pause for you, so good luck trying to snort that healing grass in time. But it's not like you have limited lives and continues, so if you're persistent, you will get past whatever keeps killing you. There's not a whole lot of story here. Some demons awaken, and you need to put them to rest. You're a demon slayer and you have a home in the Nexus and that just happens to be the hub world. Here you can buy and store stuff, upgrade your equipment, and talk to other souls. Then touch the demon inside me. You can also choose which area to visit, each of which has very few checkpoints. When you kill a demon, you'll collect its souls, hence the name of the game. The souls are basically the currency here. If you die, you lose all of the souls that you've collected. But if you can make it back to your bloodstain, which is the point where you died, you can collect all of those souls back. The screen is then conveniently blocked by giant-ass text telling you that yes, you have indeed regained your lost souls. Thanks. Speaking of bloodstains, they're all over the place. No, not in my underwear. Whoa, 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 okay. Bloody underwear, even in the fictional universe of comedy, is TMI. Let's walk it back, Joe, right? Okay, gotcha. Your voice sounds like it's being run through a Super Nintendo, by the way. Anyway, if you touch these bloodstains, you can see ghostly images of how other players died in that spot recently. You can also see ghostly white images of other people who are currently in the same area as you are. This is pretty much how the game works online. Well, there is another online aspect where you can actually go into another player's world, but I never really cared about that. The graphics are really gloomy, and so is the overall atmosphere. It's great, I love it. I've always wanted to talk about this game, but I could never fit it into any particular episode. Well, here it is. My first playthrough took me about 41 hours until I finally beat it. Playing this game again is a hell of a lot of fun, but I'm nowhere near as good as I used to be. It's a hard game, but it's not as hard as, say, Ninja Gaiden on the Xbox. And yes, I am aware of the Dark Souls games, but I just haven't played them yet. This one right here, though, just doesn't get enough love. Alright, here's the original Mega Man on Nintendo. The first game in the series and the one that started it all. Now according to a lot of you out there, this isn't the best game in the series and that might be true. But for me it's a special game that has lots of nostalgia. For example, every time I hear the music in Bomb Man's stage I immediately think of summer vacations in high school, when there was nothing to do but sleep in late and play games all day long. Man I miss those days and this was one of the games I played the most. I spent a lot of time with this one since I only had a part-time job and didn't make much money and I could only buy a game once every couple months. I had to make really careful purchases back then and thankfully this was a great purchase. At the time it was insanely hard for me and I'd get frustrated within an hour and would turn the system off or else something was going to get broken. I'm fairly sure I broke at least one controller playing this game. After I calmed down I'd try again and again and eventually I was able to run through this game quickly. No jokes per se yet but I like what you're doing Dave, very personable. Keep it up, buddy. Aw, thanks, Pat. Thanks for noticing. It wasn't until after I beat it a couple of times that I learned the trick with the pause button. You know the one. Say you fire Cutman's weapon at Dr. Wily, and you keep hitting the pause button, and every time the game unpauses, a hit is registered. If you're quick enough with it, then it just devastates enemies without any problems. 
This trick makes the game insanely easy. Is that cheating? It might be, but without it, it can be stupid hard. Capcom must have learned about this glitch because it was taken out of the rest of the series. I still think this game looks good and has some great platforming and a really catchy soundtrack. It really is a complete package, and this is just one of those games that I'll love forever since it brings me back to my younger days every time I play it. Thanks, Capcom. Let's check out Downhill Domination on the PlayStation 2. This one has you racing BMX bikes down extremely large mountains, and I love this when it was new. Your goal is, of course, to finish in the top three, but you also have attacks which kind of remind me of Road Rash. Of course, when you catch air, you can do tricks, and actually a lot of the game is built around this. Successfully landing tricks will upgrade your attack. But be careful, because it's just as easy to downgrade your attack when you mess up. Still, though, attacking is half the fun in this game. You get to defeat other racers. You get to defeat random hikers. You even get to enjoy defeating animals who are just running around not knowing what the hell is going on. Today is not a good day to be you, you stupid animal. You can choose from a variety of different bikers. Looks like I need you to pick me. Well, no one else was picking you, so apparently you do. Anyway, all of the riders are pretty noisy, but I like playing as Ajax because he talks a lot of smack. How you like him now? Watch out! Right up, tap, 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 tap. I don't know who the hell he thinks is listening to him, but he makes me laugh. Everybody makes you laugh, Joe, but you are not making me laugh, all right? Let's get out there and get the game. Come on, Let's be a playmate. I'm trying. I just have no personality. Anyway, I think I enjoyed this game as much as I did because I was really into BMX as a kid and into my early teens. And that's probably why I also like Urban Trial Freestyle on the PS3, even though this one deals with motorcycles. In this game, your steering is locked straight forward and you need to clear various stunts and obstacles as quickly as you can. The game is totally crazy. I would have loved this game back in my BMX days as I drew a comic that was 100% exactly like this game, only different. Someone please go back in time and give me this game, you'll make Little Joe really, really happy. The graphics look like they were made to fit within a small budget and the physics are kind of ragdollish, but that's all okay. It can get pretty challenging in the upper levels. It can be challenging in the beginner levels too if you happen to suck. It's still really fun trying to get past all of the crazy obstacles and a great way to kill an hour or so. This is Wampum for the NES by Jalico. In Japan, this game was called Sayuki World 2 and it starred the Monkey King who is a popular character in Chinese literature. This hero wouldn't do for the American release, so Jalico took one of the symbols of the US Wild West and made the hero a Native American called Soaring Eagle. And as far as heroes go, Soaring Eagle isn't bad. It's just a shame that they couldn't have named the game something other than Wampum. After playing this for a short time, it came to my mind that this game plays fairly similar to the other game that I've talked about in this episode, and that's Mega Man. In fact, I think they're more alike than they're different. After the first stage, then you can choose the order of the stages you want to play just like Mega Man. The stages are really nice to look at and have a lot of detail. There's a lot of climbing and descending, which is fun and easy. And the music is pretty good with a better than average soundtrack. Each level ends with a boss fight, and after you defeat a boss, they drop a weapon that you can use in future levels. The cool thing about this new weapon that you get is that it doesn't run out of energy like in Mega Man. You can use it forever and ever. Or until you die, whatever comes first. <laughs> or, until, or until you die, whichever's longer. That's good stuff, man. <laughs> yeah. Well, what? Am I lying, Pat? What? The bad part is that the spear you start the game with is the best weapon to have. I like this spear because you can collect power ups that'll increase its reach. You can also do a downward thrust, which works pretty well, but it's not perfect. The other weapons that you collect do serve a purpose, like this rotating baton that you can use to break blocks. All in all, this is a fun game that has enough of its own charm that you won't feel it's just a ripoff of Mega Man and can stand on its own just fine. If you can find it, then I'd recommend you get it, but for some reason it's one of those games that slowly keeps getting more and more expensive. This is East Origin on Windows, and I didn't get a chance to talk about this one in our East episode. Well, now it's time to remedy that. The first thing to say about this one is this is the only East game that doesn't start at all. This game actually takes place long before any of the other ones. 
you pick your character in the beginning and they'll have slightly different stories and bosses as you go throughout the game. And you know what? That's probably a good thing because the game as a whole is pretty small and really short. Just like I bet Dave's- Come on, Joseph. You know better than that. Oh, hi, Pat. Let me guess. Too easy of a joke, right? Actually, after you beat the game, you unlock a third character to play as, and he's pure evil, and he's actually really fun to play as. The entire thing takes place in Darm Tower, which fans of the series know is about a one hour section in the first game. But this one stretches it out to about 10 hours or so. Interestingly, the tower has all sorts of different environments like a fire area, a water area, and all that typical stuff. The action is pure East, that is post East 5. You press a button to swing your sword and you can also jump. You even have special attacks that you can equip and these also give you different abilities other than just crushing your foes. Like jumping further or even lighting torches. Speaking of jumping, it can be a little odd at times due to the tilted perspective. The gameplay is fairly linear, but you know what? I don't care, I enjoy the hell out of it anyway. It's just really, really fun. The graphics are typical for what we've seen from Falcom for some time, and they're not bad. And as always, the music is immensely good, and it really makes me want to keep playing. I have a Mac, and what I did to get this game to run was emulate stupid Windows 8.1 in Parallels and then run it from there while the screen capture app on the Mac side was capturing the audio and the visuals as I played. The game did crash a few times, but fortunately it knows when this happens, so you don't really lose a lot of progress. Anyway, this is more of a side quest game than anything, and I don't really hold it up there with the proper East games that have Adol as the main character. But I'm still glad I was able to play it, and I did enjoy it. If East was on, say, the PS3, then this would be a good $5 DLC add-on for a real East game. Actually, no, I hate DLC. It should have its own disc or just be unlockable. Well, that is an interesting app there, Joe, and mm -hmm. I've got to say, I, I think you're getting a lot more coaching than I am, which is, I'm not saying anything, but that's that's interesting. Well, the episode's not over yet. Let's just let's just get right back into the games. Here's McDonald's Treasure Land Adventures on the Genesis, and it was developed by none other than Treasure. Yep, the same Treasure that brought you Gunstar Heroes. I'm not exactly sure why they made this game, but maybe they were at a really low point in their career, or maybe they were offered a lifetime supply of hamburgers. All right, Dave, a little bit of hyperbole. I like to see that. Good man. Either way, it turned out to be a decent game. The first time I saw the cover, I figured it was part of the Sega Club line of games for small kids. I mean, look at the cover. It doesn't get any cuter than this. And maybe it wasn't designed especially for kids. I mean, look, the standard difficulty is a beginner. So the game is actually fun to play. You take control of Ronald, and he has a magic attack that can go all the way across the screen. He also has a scarf, which he can use on certain grapple points to pull himself up to higher areas of a level. All along the way, you'll collect all sorts of icons that mainly feed your life bar or power up your magic attack. If you're running low on life, don't worry, because there's always a store close by to purchase life and other items that you may or may not need. Just like McDonald's in real life! <laughs> what, Pat? I thought it was funny. <laughs> Each level is bursting with bright colors. They're so damn bright that you might want to wear sunglasses so you don't hurt your eyes. Levels are super long with many different areas that you'll go through, but there's only four levels total. Each one has a boss fight, and these are strange. You see, you must let the boss steal a jewel from you, and when he's eating it, then you can attack him. After you defeat him, he'll give you a piece to a treasure map that you're trying to put together. It's an easy game, so don't expect a big challenge like most of Treasure's other works, but you can expect a fun time while you're playing. I had a fun time while I played, but I just can't grasp why McDonald's? I mean, Ronald has to be one of the ugliest clowns ever invented, and the other characters from McDonald's aren't that great either. Sorry, Grimace. It's just true. So what do you say, Joe? Do you want to get a hamburger? I'm starving. I'll take a cheeseburger, thanks. Muramasa the Demon Blade on the Wii is a really cool 2D action game developed by Vanillaware. This game topped the charts in Japan, but over here, not so much. It's too bad. 
you choose one of two characters to play as. I honestly forget what the story's about since it's been a while since I played this, but it really doesn't matter. As you run around, you'll get into random battles. When you kill an enemy, you take its soul, kind of like demon souls. You have a variety of different swords that you can forge, each with their own abilities, strengths, and weaknesses. But the swords can break in battle if you use them too much, so you need to remember to switch between your swords. And just as you'd expect, the swords auto-heal when they're not being used, just like real swords. It's not a straight up action game though. There are a lot of RPG elements to this, like lots of items you need to collect, combine, or cook, and all that stuff. I don't really care for this, and I think the non-action parts of this game are a bit over-designed for their own good. But the action is really where it's at. There's lots of interconnecting scenes to travel through to accomplish your various goals. You'll be looking at the map quite a bit to figure out where you need to go. What's weird is that you jump by pressing up. I thought I'd get annoyed with this really quickly, but surprisingly it's not that bad in this game. Overall, I feel that the controls work well, everything is quick and responsive. And be sure to talk to the monkeys when you find them because they can take you to a hot spring where you can regain all your powers. You know, I think these monkeys just want to hang around with a naked girl. I mean, come on, monkeys are stupid horny. The visuals are amazing. Everything looks very colorful with tons of depth. If you've watched GameStack for any length of time, then you already know that the parallax scrolling here makes me bust a nut. And I'm sorry if that makes you feel uncomfortable. <laughs> you know, Joe, that's funny, but you got a lot of comedy happening in your underwear. And I want you to meditate on that as an artist. Hey man, it's not my fault the contents of my underwear are comical. I, I mean, yeah. Still, everything really is a visual treat for the eyes. The music is generally really good as well. If you want, you can also pick this one up on the Vita. I only wish it was on the PlayStation 3 because this game would look even better in HD. <laughs> Loaded on the PlayStation is a game that I was really looking forward to back in 1995. Seeing all the pics of gory gameplay and the fun psychotic characters you could choose from was really cool. The PlayStation was still new back then and this was something different and I was ready for a change. The game is pretty much a dungeon crawler and the object of every level is simply to find the exit. There's four colored doors that can only be accessed once you find the key of the same color. This makes for a little backtracking on each level but it's not bad. Enemies will constantly come at you and all you have to do is mow them down. You start with a basic weapon that has infinite ammo but it's underpowered. You can level it up which helps a lot but once you run out of ammo for it then your gun reverts back to its basic shot. You also have a screen clearing super attack. These are really helpful when you get bogged down by a lot of enemies. I think my favorite one is the pirate named Cap'n Hands. It looks like he releases a cloud of black death that envelopes and kills everything. It was really impressive. What's not impressive are the graphics. They don't look as good as they did in 1995, especially if you play the game completely zoomed in. I don't know why you'd want to play this way since you can barely see 5 feet in front of your character. Zoom out and enjoy a wider view. The only thing that I liked about zooming in is being able to see details like the writing on prison walls. Poor John is gonna die. I wonder what he did as he clearly pissed somebody off. Why are you looking at me like that? The lighting in this game is pretty bad too. There's a lot of spots where it's so damn dark that you can't see what's going on. If you shoot your weapon it helps, but I don't like that. The game does have a decent soundtrack and if you want you can pop the CD directly into your audio CD player and enjoy it anytime. Overall this isn't a bad game, but it does get boring after a short time since you do the exact same thing in every level and the backgrounds don't change enough to keep it interesting. Just don't go out of your way to get this one. Dragon's Crown on the PlayStation 3 is another great 2D game from Vanillaware. You can also get it for the Vita. It's basically a really stylish hack and slash beat em up. There's a bunch of enemies to fight and if you have three other friends it can be enjoyed by four players simultaneously. Or you could do that with online friends if you don't like being near other people. There's a central town where you do all of your other business like upgrading your weaponry, learning skills, acquiring new quests, and a bunch of other stuff. It's actually a lot more complex than you might think. Like Muramasa, the non-action parts feel a bit over-designed for my taste. The game isn't something that you can just pick up and play. During the actual battle scenes, you can move a cursor around with the right stick and select actions, like having the thief pick a lock on a treasure chest or a door. There are also random spots in the background that you can touch which will drop money or whatnot. The action is pretty crazy and it can get so crowded that you actually lose track of where your character is. That's okay, I just keep pressing attack until I can train my eyes on him again. 
Each character tends to drop their weapon a lot as well. Who trained these fighters? But when you do drop it, you fight with your fists. After a few seconds, the weapon can be picked back up again. As you can see, the graphics are freaking gorgeous and they look like handmade paintings. And once again, yes, I really enjoy the multi-layered scrolling effects. A lot of people got bent out of shape about the characters who also appear, well, bent out of shape. Yeah, they have some exaggerated designs, but I still think they're pretty cool looking. Bones, man. <laughs> the music's fine, but usually I don't even notice it. I guess it's better than having bad music, you know, like country. There is a narrator who really likes to talk though, and it's kind of cool at times, and other times he just keeps saying the same thing over and over, and it gets kind of annoying. The name of the demon king, Majino Gusna Idrashin. Still though, this game is totally worth a look. So look at it. The inside of the cave connects to a fissure on the coastline. It seems large enough to contain another ocean. Sailors dread passing through this area. There are myriad tales of ships disappearing here. Gargoyles Quest by Capcom is hands down one of the best Game Boy games out there. After completely hating the red demons in every single Ghouls and Ghosts and Ghosts and Goblins game to this date, it's a nice change to be able to play as one of them. You know, it'd be fun to play as Firebrand fighting against all the good people with Arthur from Ghouls and Ghosts being the final boss. That'd be a nice change, but you're still fighting against evil here. This is still good though, because it's just fun in general. It's a hybrid game of action platforming with some light RPG stuff thrown in for good measure. It's like an RPG because you have an overworld map that you traverse from town to town into dungeons. Every now and again you'll get into a random battle just like an RPG, but these are all fought in real time. Fighting with Firebrand is a bit different since he's a red demon. Just look how red he is! Still can't see it? Okay, how about now? Look! <laughs> Come on Pat, it's the damn Game Boy, use your imagination man! You shoot projectiles at your enemies like any other game, but he can also hover for a short period of time with his wings. It's a fun mechanic, but it can be frustrating at first since he starts out so weak. At the beginning of the game, you spend more time making sure Firebrand doesn't land on spikes than you do about attacking your enemy. As the game progresses, you earn more life and the ability to hover longer and jump higher. Once you get these attributes, the game actually becomes a bit easier. Since the game focuses so much on Firebrand's flying ability, the action levels are really fun to play. The platforming is tricky with spikes and enemies at every turn, but there's always a wall close by that Firebrand can cling to. Boss fights are great too and will really test your platforming skills. The quest isn't super long, but it's fun visiting towns and advancing the story. The game does have a password system, and the best part about it is it's only 8 characters long. Also, I'm a huge fan of the art style in this game. I love that a lot of stuff like trees inside levels to the outside of dungeons have evil faces on them. All of the worlds are loaded with detail, and I love the enemy sprites. They look so cool! The music is top notch also. For a Game Boy game, it has some of the richest sound I've ever heard on the system. This is definitely a game you need to play. It's such a great experience, so don't pass it by if you see it. Alright, there we go. Those are more games that we've just always wanted to talk about. I had a, I had a lot of fun talking about East Origin because I never got the chance to talk about it before. Does that mean you're going to start playing a lot more PC games? I hope it doesn't. No, probably not because my PC can't handle that kind of stuff. Oh, but, okay. but, but, you know, um, it was still fun to cover. What yeah. would you like covering the most? Yeah, I, um, what did I like covering the most? Gosh, probably Gargoyles Quest. That's one of my favorite games. So Not bad. Yeah, not bad. I liked it. Anyway, what did you guys think of the games that we covered here? Let us know. And in the meantime, thank you for watching Game Set. Pat Kilbane, thank you very much, but there's only room for one comedy genius on GameSack, and if it can't be me, well, I'm not gonna let it be you either, so see ya. Now, I should probably play a game that I would never talk about on GameSack. Yeah, this is what I'm talking about. King Salmon on the 16-bit Sega Genesis. Oh, yeah. 
Pat Gilbane, what the hell are you doing here? I thought we shut you off. Well, my humor coach app is going so well, I thought I'd start coaching video games. What are you guys going there? Come on, Pat Gilbane, I'm trying to relax with the 16-bit masterpiece from Vic Tokai here. Leave me alone. <laughs> that boat is like... Ooh, you do not make fun of my game, Pat Gilbane. Maybe a little water log. You're a water log. Plug lure? Oh man, good luck with that. Shut up, Pat Kilbane, I'll use whatever damn lure I want to use. You're trying to catch something, you just like making little splooshes in the water. You're getting on my last nerve, Pat Kilbane. Hey, Pat. Hey, Dave, hey, what's up, buddy? Are you guys conspiring against me? No, no, dude, definitely not. Sarcasm, two points. So what's up? I'm fishing, what the hell does it look like? You're using a plug lure? You're not gonna catch anything with that, you idiot. <laughs>